Artivism, the use of art for critical change. Um, the basic flow is I'm going to give a background. I want to give a background on Zimbabwe and then looking at international examples of artivism. Then after that, we'll dive into the dangers of artivism and then um, the gray area, um, the topic that I just like to call the gray area, and then ending off the session with the way forward and questions and answers. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to just write them in the chat and then we'll get to it once um, I've kind of finished the whole presentation. So just a brief on the topic is how important the arts industry is and how great um, its influence can be um, and how it can be used as a powerful tool, especially in countries where freedom of speech is non-existent. So as I mentioned earlier, I come from a country called Zimbabwe. For those of you who don't know it, um, we are located in Southern Africa. We sit right on top of South Africa. And it's a very small country with a population of about 14 million people. Um, we had our independence in 1980. Um, technically, according to the history books, we've had three presidents. Um, that's Kanan Banana, Robert Mugabe, and um, Emerson Mnangagwa. But um, according to how our country likes to rewrite its history, we've only had two presidents, and that would be Robert Mugabe and Emerson Mnangagwa, who's the current president of the country. Um, so yes, as I was saying, um, our president, Robert Mugabe, um, leader of the ruling party, things are very complicated in Zimbabwe because they weren't very keen on freedom of speech. Um, I think this is probably something that they adopted from um, the colonialized um, government and the colonialized regime. And so we had a big issue of freedom of speech. Even having an opposition party was a very big mission in Zimbabwe. Um, our first opposition party only came out in the early 2000s. And, but all before that, we only had one party running for election. So it was obvious, an obvious win every time. Um, when the opposition party came into power, that's when a lot of issues started popping up in Zimbabwe in terms of freedom of speech because people started really speaking out about the problems they had with the government in terms of corruption. Um, there was the Land Reform Act that happened also where they reallocated land um, to the native black people of the country. And how they did this was by violently removing the white farmers from their farms. And this gave a lot of attention to the country. It got a lot of international sanctions. And basically, there was just a lot going on in Zimbabwe from the early 2000s, the late 1990s. Um, then we also had our economic crisis where um, our currency crashed. And this was in 2008 when we now had to start using Forex. So we were using the pound, we were using the US dollar. We were using the South African Rand. We were basically a multi-currency country because our local currency, the inflation rate was way too high. So basically everyone who was in Zimbabwe got an opportunity to become a billionaire. I wish I'd actually come with a note to show you all, but um, we were basically all billionaires for a short time in our lives. Um, moving on from that, um, in 2017, um, for the first time ever, we managed to get rid of Robert Mugabe, who was the president for over 37 years um, of Zimbabwe. And um, the nation was given an opportunity by the army to get into the streets and actually publicly say that they did not want Robert Mugabe to be the president. That's from 2017, when um, the country basically was given an opportunity to go into the streets and march against um, the government, saying that we wanted a new president, we didn't want um, Robert Mugabe to be the president anymore. And that was successful because two weeks after the march happened, he was removed from power. He resigned as the president. Um, a year later, we had elections, um, and that's this image. And after those elections, people weren't happy with the results because the ruling parties and the PF won those elections, but people didn't believe that the results were correct. So people went into the streets and they protested again, as is their right. And in response, the government released the army, which then shot at people. Um, this is actually an image from inside the CBD. It was about a, a good two, three days of um, the army cracking down on civilians um, in the city center and in certain neighborhoods. And then the last image, um, this is from 2019, last year, 
in August when people were protesting against the living conditions in Zimbabwe. And again, as you can see, the police was cracking down on them. Um, are these people actually innocently, um, non-violently protesting. They were just sitting in one of the major streets in our city center. And um, the government then released the police um, on them as a way to kind of get them out of the streets. So just from those few examples, I think you can all see that it's very difficult in Zimbabwe to kind of express how you feel. Again, last year we had a situation where um, our doctors went on strike because they wanted more um, equipment inside the public hospitals because there wasn't enough equipment in the hospitals. Medicine was expensive and we were in a situation where you couldn't get free medication in the hospital. You would actually have to get a prescription from the doctor and then go to a pharmacy that would then charge in foreign currency, which a lot of people could not afford. And the government then arrested in quotes, um, one of the lead doctors who was um, kind of the face of that whole protest. And, um, and when they, um, they basically this doctor disappeared for like three days. And um, after the protest then got worse, then the government finally released him. However, they had done something to him. So he actually currently cannot practice um, medicine anymore, which is really unfortunate. So that's basically um, the Zimbabwean situation, that it's not really the best place for you to express your feelings, it's not the safest place for you to express your opinions about the government. Um, when the new dispensation did come into power, they did kind of promote um, freedom of speech, which is one of our constitutional rights. They said that as long as you have the right paperwork, you're allowed to go into the streets and protest and say whatever you want to say about the government, there was no issue about it. But currently there's actually a law called the cyber law that they're trying to pass, which is basically restricting what people say on social media. Um, so it's actually quite complicated in Zimbabwe, as I'd mentioned earlier. So just moving on to um, looking at the international platform in terms of artivism, um, there are just a few um, artists that I wanted to highlight. Um, first of all, um, Bob Marley, I'm sure we're all aware of Bob Marley and the influence that he had, but I wanted to pay attention to one particular circumstance where um, just before the Smile Jamaica concert, for those of you who don't know what that's about, um, in the 1970s, Bob Marley was, came up, well, he was kind of invited to perform at this concert that was kind of promoting peace in Jamaica just before the elections. And the issue about this performance and this concert, which was a free concert, was that it looked like he was affiliated to a party, but each party wasn't sure which party he was affiliated to. But um, for Bob Marley, he was just doing this concert because he believed in the message behind the concert um, and having a peaceful Jamaica. And a few days before the concert, he was actually shot. Um, there was an assassination attempt on his life. And um, he still went on stage and performed, showed his um, gunshot wounds to the audience and he was like nah I'm gonna you know let the show go on because he really believed in the concert and the idea behind it. Um, there's also the Dixie Chicks. Um, for those of you who don't know them it's an American country band, um, three females um, if I'm not mistaken and they released a song just after they won three Grammys. They um, wrote a song of speaking openly against the war in Iraq and speaking openly against um, George Bush. And because of this, they were banned on so many radio stations and they received a major backlash for them openly speaking about how they felt about um, the war in Iraq and in Iran. Um, the next artist that I wanted to briefly talk about is Lucky Dube. Um, he's a South African, was well, sorry, a South African artist. And he basically, his second album um, after he got into the music industry was banned in South Africa because the apartheid got, government assumed that it would instigate the people. But Lucky Dube was actually very popularly known for his music that really openly spoke about, you know, socio-economic issues, um, politics, um, injustices around the world. So it was very interesting that, you know, earlier on in his career, his music was banned because they felt that it instigated too many issues in South Africa. Um, just a few organizations that I also um, wanted to 
call attention to um, is the One Billion Rising campaign. This is a yearly campaign um, where it has trying to promote about a billion women around the world to kind of speak up against gender-based violence. And then there's also Play for Change, which is a music campaign um, organization that's just about spreading hope um, and unity around the world. So these are just a few examples of you know, creators and creative organizations that, you know, I don't know whether it was intentionally when they started their careers, but um, that kind of went into the line of using artivism to kind of get those tricky conversations going and getting people in the country to think differently about certain things and not just be sheep that follow a certain ideology. Um, yes, so bringing it back home, and by home I mean back to my home in Zimbabwe, um, we have a few examples of, you know, creators that have used artivism. Some were very um, successful with their artivism campaigns um, and others not so successful. Um, I think I can share the screen. I will read out what the text says, but I will just, um, okay, there we go. So um, to start off with, we have um, this gentleman is Thomas Mapumo, and um, he's a local artist. And in 1989, um, he released an album about corruption, and it was mainly focusing on criticizing the Robert Mugabe government and regime. And because of that, they then basically set him up to get arrested. Um, and um, so he self-exiled to the States um, in 1989 until 2017, when um, Robert Mugabe was um, de-seated from the political situation in Zimbabwe. Um, then secondly, we have Oliver Mtukuzi. I'm sure most of you might know who he is. Again, another local artist. Um, he passed away last year. And um, he was very popularly known, um, especially in Zimbabwe, for a single that he released. And the single was entitled Fuma, which basically means, um, you know, allow it to happen. And basically what the song was talking about was, um, it was talking about allowing yourself as an old person to, you know, to let go of the power. And um, it was alleged that the song was about um, Robert Mugabe remaining in power for so many years, despite the fact that he was getting very old. The song was actually banned from local radio for some time. Then we have, um, sorry, this gentleman over here. This is um, Davis Guja, and he is a playwright, um, a very influential playwright in Zimbabwe. He's very well known for a lot of his political plays. Um, there is an incident that happened in Zimbabwe in the 1980s, um, late 1980s, where the two tribes were fighting each other and notoriously the one tribe was actually almost completely destroyed um well murdered massacred um by the ruling party and this issue is never actually spoken about in our country because it's a very sensitive issue and after the new regime came into power they spoke about trying to make reparations and things like that but they still didn't want to kind of admit to the whole issue because as I mentioned earlier, it's a very sensitive issue. But um, Davis Guja is very popularly known for writing plays about that issue and was actually arrested early last year for one of um, his latest productions about the new regime. Okay, and then lastly, we have these two gentlemen. This is Comrade Fatso and this is Outspoken. Um, they're both um, local rappers and, sorry, and they're very popularly known for um, their music. They wrote a lot of music that was very politically associated, speaking of very openly against the government. They used to hope open mic, um, host open mic events where they spoke very, very openly about the government. And um, one of the interesting things about them is that from that, they then grew into a whole festival um, that they hosted and which mainly focused on young people having an opportunity to speak freely about what's happening in the government. From that festival, they then launched an organization. From that organization, they now had smaller, um, smaller entities like a creative hub called Mortar Republic, which I'll speak about a bit later. 
Um, and they have another network called The Feed, which is a Twitter handle that basically talks about a lot of political issues. They also have Open Parley, where they talk about issues that happen in Parliament. They have a satirical show called The Weekend and Zambezi News. And basically on those satirical shows, they basically talk about politics, um, but in a lighter kind of, in, you know, using comedy and very openly speaking against the government and also the opposition party. Um, they're just a very honest kind of satirical platform um, where they speak about a lot of issues that happen in Zimbabwe. Um, their journey was not easy. Um, in the first days of the festival, they were arrested a number of times. Fortunately for Comrade Fatso, um, he's actually a UK citizen. So he had a lot of protection from, obviously, from the UK government. But outspoken, had a lot of issues. He was being followed by um, undercover agents. Um, you know, government agents were following him and his family, threatening him. He was receiving threatening calls. And um, it was a very scary experience for him. But they've both kind of made it through. And they continue with their work um, despite the the danger of being um, an artivist. Which brings me to um, the next topic, which is um, the dangers of artivism. As I mentioned, Zimbabwe is a very, we, our government is so sensitive, um, to put it lightly. And we've had so many circumstances where activists are arrested, they are kidnapped, they're brutally assaulted, and these cases are not followed up by the government. Um, there's actually, one ongoing case with the man Itai Zamara, a, a well-known activist. He's been missing for over five years and the government will not reveal whether he's alive or whether he's dead, um, you know, what happened to him. They just don't speak about him, but his family still very openly, every year they ask the government um, where he is. They ask for his body, like if he's dead so they can bury him. They just want to know the situation with him. But the government does not speak about this man at all. But it's a well-known fact that he was um, abducted by government agents. Um, bringing it back to artists that are in the line of artivism, there's an artist, her name is um, Samantha Kurea, also known as Gonyet, which basically means truck <laughs> in Shana. And um, she's a comedian, a local comedian who started her career doing um, videos on her phone. And she then joined an organization called Bus Stop TV. And they are a small group of um, filmmakers and comedians that basically use satire to advertise. Initially, the, they were using satire to advertise for businesses and organizations. They then um, connected with the, the two artists I'd mentioned earlier, Comrade Fatso and Outspoken, and now started focusing um, their content on socioeconomic issues. And um, they had a good run for about two years. And then last year, um, Samantha Kurea was actually abducted by government agents. Um, but initially she was abducted by the police. They arrested her and they said she was being arrested because she impersonated an officer in one of her videos. And this video was from two years ago. So already the charges were very, um, very shaky and very shady. And um, after a, a two day Twitter campaign of getting the police to release her and getting um, the government agents to release her, she was finally released, but she was um, physically assaulted. She could not walk. Um, they had broken or fractured one of her bones in her leg and um, she was beaten in the face and everything and she had to be hospitalized when she was released. Um, however, fortunately for her, she's had the opportunity to um, continue her work um, with Bus Stop TV. Um, I've just got some images that I can show you. So that's her, and um, that's an image of her when she was in the hospital after she was assaulted by government agent, agents. Sorry. Um, the second artist I want to look at, um, one of my favorites, um, his name is Winky D, also known as Wallace Chirumiko. Sorry, I'm not so used to his legal name. You just know him as Winky D. And um, as you can see, his, um, this is a cover art for his album. As you can see the chains around his head with the locks and everything. So, um, Winky D is a local Zim Dancehall artist. Zim Dancehall is basically Zimbabwean dancehall music. And um, he was really known for his satirical lyrics that addressed um, 
you know, just depicted the everyday life of Zimbabweans. Then his last three albums kind of took a turn towards um, socioeconomic issues and political issues, but um, because his lyrics were so colorful and um, very creatively done, you couldn't really pinpoint that he was blatantly speaking about um, politics or speaking about the ruling party. Um, and then in 2018, um, he released a single called Jecha. Jecha is basically in, translated into English, it's um, sand, yeah. So there's a statement in, in Shana, a slang term that says Kutlirwa Jecha, which basically means um, raining on someone's parade, basically. So um, the opposition party found it very interesting, um, the song that, you know, Winky D had written, and they took the song and they used it as a campaign slogan. So basically they were going around saying that, well, we're raining on the ruling party's parade because we're going to keep fighting for justice for the elections, the 2017 elections. And because of that, um, Winky D was then harassed by... Um, by the ruling party. Um, he had a concert in 2018, December, and he was literally a attacked on stage um, just as he was about to perform that song. And then last year, he released a new album. And because um, of the artwork that I showed you with the chains around his head, um, it was very obvious that he was, you know, it had some sort of a connection to the situation in Zimbabwe that people are very oppressed. Because last year was a, a year that was very heavy in riots and demonstrations and police brutality and a lot of um, strikes and demonstrations by you know doctors and teachers and civil servants it was a very bad year for Zimbabwe basically and for him to now then release an album that kind of implied that he was addressing those issues in the album the government was very afraid and they tried to hinder the album launch um, by throwing a lot of paperwork on him to try and um, delay the date of his release but fortunately he managed to release the album and it's doing very well on the local charts. Okay, um, let me know if I'm going too fast for you. <laughs> um, so just moving on to the next section, um, which is the gray area. And basically in Zimbabwe, we have so many groups that have found this gray area where it's safe to, to address certain political issues happening in the country. But um, again, there still is a very high risk that you know, your career might be permanently damaged, that your family or yourself might be um, kidnapped, physically assaulted, abused. Um, basically, it's not very safe in this country. There's always that high risk factor, but I think that risk factor happens if anywhere in the world. When you put yourself out there, you're always open for attack. Um, but some of the gray areas that I've seen where a lot of artists have managed to kind of keep themselves safe. For example, Davis Guja, who I mentioned earlier, um, who writes a lot, a lot of political plays. He's married to um, a lady who runs one of the biggest NGOs in this country. And to a certain extent that offers him some form of protection, as much as sometimes he does push his limits and the government will then retaliate, but they would never try anything too extreme because of the position that his wife has um, you know, on the international platform and also locally in the country as um, the head of one of the biggest NGOs in the country. Um, again, if you're not based locally in Zimbabwe, it's very easy for you to be very political. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, Comrade Fatso is one of, he's not a Zimbabwean citizen, but um, he's born in Zimbabwe, but he still has his um, British citizenship. So, um, but he empathizes with um, Zimbabweans, but because he's mostly out of the country, he's then also very safe from being brutalized and being attacked and being targeted by the um, government agents. Um, secondly, if your content is very artistic, I've noticed that a lot of the times, if your content is very artistic, it takes the government a while to catch on. Um, a good example, like I mentioned earlier, is Winky D, the album, which had the single that provoked the government, had a lot of songs that were very political. If you really listen to the lyrics, you could tell that he was really saying something. But I think the government maybe didn't catch on fast enough until the opposition party was like, oh, we see what this guy's talking about. And they now started using it against the ruling party. Um, again, if you're backed by NGOs, embassies, um, that really helps out a lot because um, as, as I mentioned earlier, 
<laughs> yes, the government really are Philistines. It's it's hectic in Zimbabwe, guys. It's really hectic. Um, sorry, just looking. Um, if you're connected to embassies, if you're connected to NGOs, if you have support from embassies, if you have support from NGOs, you are most likely going to be safe. Um, a good example is we recently had a, a, another abduction that happened um, a few weeks, ago, um, just last week actually, um, with um, MPs from the opposition party. And they were speaking up saying that the government needs to feed people during this COVID time because people are starving. And they know that the government was given funding. And um, three ladies were abducted for about three to four days. And it's only because, you know, the American embassy started asking questions and the EU started asking questions that these girls then resurfaced. And suddenly, you know, the police were so concerned about their well-being and trying to find out who abducted them. But like everyone knew that, you know, it was the government. Um, I guess another way to another gray area is your level of fame or popularity. Um, <laughs> I can give an example of a few artists I know um, that aren't very, they're not famous, they're not very popular, but they're very open about their feelings about our government. And they've managed to be very political in all of their content that they're releasing, all of their music, and they haven't yet been targeted by the government. I guess it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because if people aren't hearing the message, it's not really serving its purpose, but at the same time, it's keeping them safe. Um, there is also a conspiracy theory in Zimbabwe that we have a third force in the ruling party and this third force is actively working against the government. So this is another gray area if you find yourself in cahoots with the third force. Um, you're assumed to be a bit safe in the situation of um, abduction and being able to use your art to openly speak against the government. Um, the last three are, are are pretty much in the same area, which is knowing your laws and having support from human rights lawyers. I've noticed that a lot of um, a lot of the artists in Zimbabwe know a lot about the law. They know the constitutional rights, and therefore you have some sense of safety and security when you know your rights. Because most of the times, how they attack you is that they you'll get arrested by the local police, and then from there, that's where maybe the the government agents then now take you from their from the police custody and then they have their way with you. So most of the times if you know your law, if you know the laws, then you know that has some way of protecting you from um from you know from being in danger. Um last um the last two is just about having an exit strategy. Um I'd mentioned um Magamba Network that's run by Comrade Fatso and Outspoken, the two rappers. And one of the things that they have is they have a, a local hub called Motor Republic. And that hub was because they're very anti the government, the government found a way to try and, you know, get them where it hurts. And they decided to try and um, shut down their hub because the hub was made out of, it's out of recycled containers. And basically the government was saying that um, the structure wasn't safe, but this structure had been up for almost two years and then suddenly now the government decided that no it's not safe we want to shut it down so the exit strategy for motor republic was um they had two strategies the initial strategy was that they had um ladders at the back of the um premises so people could just if the police came to try and arrest anybody they would just kind of climb over the wall and <laughs> hide from the police and then a more long-term strategy that they had, especially when they were getting a lot of problems from um, the local government on the structure and trying to close down the structure, is that they hosted a street party. And they called on people to come through. They're like, listen, we're going to have a street party. If they shut us down, they shut us down. If they don't, um, that's great. But they were like, we want to have a street party where everyone signs to fight um, this unlawful closure of the space. So again, because they knew their laws, um, they had an exit strategy and they also had lawyers on their side. So after the street party, the whole issue was then dropped by the government and the space is still open and functional to date. Um, lastly, it's the other gray area is that you just have to be really brave and just go all out and be as loud as you can. Because when, you're, when you get too much attention, the government tends to kind of leave you alone out of fear of, you know, what the international um, 
you know, the international laws will say and what um, people around the world will actually say if this person goes missing or if they disappear. So sometimes they will touch you, but they won't be as intense as they will with other people where you have to maybe go into exile. Um, a good example is Pastor Even. Um, in 2016, he started a campaign called This Flag. And the campaign was very simple. It just said, every Zimbabwean, if you're frustrated, if you're upset, we want to reclaim our country for our own and reclaim our flag as our own flag. And he was just like, walk around with your flag, everybody. And um, that campaign ran for a while. And, you know, the government was like, okay, he's got a bit of a pull because he was a pastor. So they're like, okay, he's got a bit of an influence, but he's not too much of a threat. So they left him alone. And then a few months later, he called for a national, a national lockdown. So the whole country locked down for 24 hours because this pastor just said, guys, let's shut down to show the government that we're very serious and that we're not happy with what's happening in the country. And after that, that's when the government got a bit shook and <laughs> they weren't feeling very safe about just leaving this guy to do as he willed with the country and with people's emotions. But because he had gotten so much attention on the international media, they couldn't do much to him except for send him a couple of threats. I know that they had threatened him for a while. They sent him a couple of calls. Um, he did go to America for some time for, to seek asylum. And then he's now back in the country. He's actually, he actually ran um, in the last elections to be an MP. Unfortunately, he didn't win, but he's still very active in the political. Okay. And so... The importance of artivism, artivism is so important, but I think it's about being strategic um, in your work. It's about knowing where you can stay safe, knowing who you should speak to, knowing your laws, because the law will always be on your side. Freedom of speech is something, um, it's your constitutional right. And in Zimbabwe, a lot of the times people don't know the law, they just want to get out in the streets and, you know, make the noise and get people active. But if you know the law, if you have the law on your side, you are in a safer situation. Also the power of numbers, if you have a lot of people joining in these artivism campaigns with you, that's also great because the more people that know what you're doing, it also kind of acts as a protective shield around you. Zimbabwe Twitter is very powerful. The minute anything happens, they are already active and tweeting and getting you know international world aware. They're getting embassies aware of anything that happens. So as long as you have the support of the people, you're also, um, to a certain extent, um, safe. And just to close off today's sessions, I just wanted to close off with a quote from Toni Morrison. And it says, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. So thank you guys. That's my presentation. If you guys have any questions, anything you want to ask or add, any comments, now's the time to do it. Hi. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was amazing. We go through like a different version of that over here in the UK, but not as brutal, but the violence, not as violent, but you just you see resources fly up in front of you for not saying the right thing. And I just mm. interesting how it happens in different parts of the world. Like, how do you guys like sniff out rats and like obviously somebody on the ground translating the music to the government? So how do you know who to trust? And do you think that's foreign influence in Zimbabwe? Because I was doing some research recently and I think it was as early as the eighties you guys were described as a breadbasket of Africa. Mm -hmm. and that wasn't long ago yeah <laughs> so it's just like how do you and it's just like i find it fascinating like i work in marketing and i look at personal branding and stuff like that how um mm -hmm. robert mugabe has just become this figurehead of everything wrong with zimbabwe but prior to him it was called Rhodesia, and no one talks about cecil Rhodes. no one talks about him over here internationally He's killed more people than Hitler. And mm. you go on Bond Street over here and you see the De Beers company. And you're just mm -hmm. like, you're just living this constant, um, I don't know what to do. Britain's literally a simulation. <laughs> I don't know. 
things are just happening in front of you and you're just like, can nobody see through this? But mm. I think the Garby was a massive distraction, but it's just like, how is it? Do you think there's foreign agents on the floor with the amount of diamonds and stuff that's in that country, and natural resources? Definitely. Um, there definitely are foreign um, agents there, um, especially with like we have so many Chinese people in Zimbabwe. It's unbelievable. Like, I think they're going to start making, you know, Mandarin a second tongue here because <laughs> we just have so many of them here. And they're in all of the mines. Um, but at the same time, you also have a lot of, um, we have a lot of people from America. You have a lot, as much as we're under sanctions, you still have American companies that have a lot of um, shares in a lot of Zimbabwean businesses um, when it comes to the minerals and the diamonds and things like that. So it's all about, you know, what the government wants us to understand about what they want us to know and what they want us to understand about what's going on on the ground. And um, when you were speaking about how do we find the rats, the thing is, so we have, like secret i put it in quotes because like they're not that secret when we can all tell that this guy is a secret agent but like we have government agents yes when you put it that way we have government agents um that we call c10s um or cios and you can basically tell who they are because they're everywhere um there was recently a summit that was held in south africa last year with creators from all over southern africa and we actually made a joke as um some of some of the guys from Zim were like, we're so sure that there's one guy who's here who's definitely a government agent because you'll never have a gathering of any sort where you don't have a government agent there. Um, gathering information, finding out what people are talking about, especially when there is some sort of, um, when it's donor funded, if that makes sense. Um, especially because if it's, you know, anything that's funded by the UK or if it's funded by America, basically any country that's in the West, you'll definitely have, um, you know, a secret agent guy who's there collecting information, finding out what exactly you're talking about, what you guys are doing, because they see that as their biggest threat is because once, you know, some form of archivism is funded financially, then it kind of makes it to a certain extent unstoppable. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, can I jump in, Andre? Yeah, yeah, jump in. It kind of connects with um, Jay's question as well. Um, cause it, it, thank you, Vera, for everything that you've shared as well. It just sounds so heavy and constant and oppressive and the weight of everything. Um, Jay's, Jay said about, um, you know, he's doing this kind of work um, online. Is it safe for you? And my, my extension of that was going to be like, where are the spaces um, in your experience that actually do feel safe, like more broadly, like, you know, is, it, is, is that possible? Is it feasible to be an artist or self-express in any creative way and be safe anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, they actually, there used to be an organisation called Pamberi Trust. Um, Pamberi just means forward. Um, and this organisation was functional for I think over 10 to 15 years and it was basically focusing on creating a safe space for you know artists to come together and to express themselves and that was one of the safest places um, for artists unfortunately because of mismanagement of funds um, they closed down but another space that is very safe is um, Motor Republic that I had mentioned in the presentation and um, it's a hub, they host their events, they have their festival, and um, it's just basically, again, a very safe space for, you know, creatives just come and share their opinions. If you have a very political poem that you want to, you know, present to an audience, you can do it without any judgment. Um, there's, there also used to be a festival called Haifa. Unfortunately, we haven't had it for about for a year now. I think it's two years now. Um, but Haifa is one of the most... Um, well, Hypo is one of the most mismanaged, um, one of, sorry, one of the most political um, festivals ever. And when I say political, I mean, they would have opening, like the festival would literally open with this production where they would latently talk about what's going wrong in the country. And, you know, as much as, you know, the government really tried to, you know, 
shut them down and to stop them from doing anything. They always just managed to find a way. And all of the artists before, after, and during the festival were always safe in that space. So there are some spaces that are available. Unfortunately, nowadays, um, there aren't as many um, safe spaces because a lot of them shut down, as I mentioned earlier, because of mismanagement of funds, which is very unfortunate. Hi, Vera. Hi. Uh, I have a question. How is um, the hub that you run, like, because you are talking about different places, but how is the place that you run in terms of everything that you have been talking? Okay, so as Incubator, um, we're a baby hub. We've only been running for about two years now. And we, we started off small scale. Um, our first um, production we ever did was actually in a year after, no, sorry, it was actually the year of the shooting that happened in the city center. And one of our artists actually wrote a poetry piece. And what we did is <laughs> we found a way to to present it in a way that wouldn't get people really knowing that we were being very political about the whole production. So it started off with, you know, um, a, a, a kind of comical version of, you know, the police chasing the civilians. And then from there, it got into a poetry piece where we spoke about, um, you know, women and the lack of finding sanitary wear. And then also talking about, you know, now as we were talking about blood flowing, then we kind of brought in hints of, you know, the army shooting and some civilians and things like that. And we managed to get away with it, which shocked us because we were really expecting, because um, we did it, the production in two cities, um, Harare and Bulawayo, and those are the two major cities in Zimbabwe. So we were right and we're like, okay, any day now, they're gonna come knocking on our doors and we need to have a good excuse. But fortunately we were safe. And last year we decided not to go the political route. We were just focusing more on social issues. Um, so we were focusing on the 16 days of gender-based violence. And, um, you know, it was, we were safe there again. You know, we managed to kind of get away with it because no one really takes that as a threat, you know, in the political um, aspect. But this year we are, you know, given that we're in Corona times, um, we had had plans of trying something a bit more risky um, in terms of our production, our yearly productions. And um, because of Corona, we're not too sure about how we can maybe um, present that. And also in light of what's just happened a few weeks ago, we really have to make sure that we have the law on our side. We know, you know, what we can really get away with and what would probably get us into a lot of trouble. First question is, how relevant is artivism to planning community spaces? Um, and then the second is, is this kind of sense of security and sense of danger, is it equal across all artists? So is it the sense of performance artists, as it may be politicians um, or like makers, or all, the, all the different types of artists? artists Okay, um, I'll start with your second question first. Um, so with the artivism in Zimbabwe, it's mostly with um, performance arts. So in terms of theater, like um, it actually initially started with theater and music. Those are the two main um, art forms that people were using for artivism. Like you'd have a flash theater performance or it would be theater productions um, done in small theaters around the country. And then, um, you know, obviously with the music, you know, we'd have artists like Oliver Mtubuti, as I mentioned before, and um, Thomas Magfumo, who would just openly write songs. And yeah, the music would get banned on radio, but people would still find a way to find the music. Um, poetry and, you know, hip hop now also have become the, I guess, the millennial kind of um, art form for artivism. And um, we're seeing more, um, poets, especially. Uh, we have a very strong poetry movement in Zimbabwe that's growing. And a lot of the poets are very political in their pieces. They're very um, open about their opinions about the government and everything in their pieces. So that's one thing that's really started developing. Um, in terms of, you know, visual arts, um, you have a few visual artists here and there. Um, there's actually one artist, his name is Kufa, and he's not based in Zimbabwe, but he used, he did a lot of um, pieces that were very um, politically associated, um, spoke very openly about the government. But you won't find a lot of um, 
visual artists kind of playing with artivism as per se. Um, not that I'm really aware of, because most of the galleries, unfortunately, are associated to the government. So even if you did make these pieces, the chances of them being showcased are very low. Um, and then in terms of how relevant artivism is, I think it really is, it's very relevant, especially in these times where, especially in the form of music, um, like I mentioned before, there's a growing genre in Zimbabwe called Zim Dancehall, and practically everyone listens to it. It's everywhere. And a lot of the times these artists, when they release a song, like literally on the same day, the song goes viral. Um, there was an artist that actually performed at, I think he was unintentionally speaking against the government, but um, he went to perform at a, 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 a rally and the government was like, no, um, you guys shouldn't be screaming for him. You should be screaming for the president. And he's like, this guy is nothing. And then the guy literally a day later released a song saying that, uh, nah, I'm not nothing, I'm everything. And like, you know, it became a hit and the whole country is kind of listening to the song like, oh gosh, you know, the government can't touch this guy. So it really is relevant. I think it's gotten people a bit more confident. Um, like I said, last year really was our year of people speaking out and having riots, having um, demonstrations, you know, fighting for their rights and things like that. People really speaking out, as I said, on Twitter. I think a lot of more people on social media are really speaking out compared to two years ago when the internet was turned off because we were speaking too much about what was happening in the country. So I think artivism really is playing a big role. And I think the more confident more people get, the more, um, yeah, the more people feel a bit more secure about, you know, diving into artivism, I think the bigger the movement will get. I hope that answered your question. Did you put the, the other question was, um, how relevant the artivism is in planning community spaces? Yeah, it is relevant. Um, I just, like I said, we don't have a lot of, um, we don't have a lot of artistic spaces that are really accessible to everyone. So it's still like a grayish area, but in terms like, but if you're just focusing on music solely, then it is something that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it is something that is very relevant and that reaches the crowds, even things like theater, because people really are moved by theater. Zimbabweans love drama and theater plays and productions and things like that. And, um, you know, short films is something we call Biscopia, where they basically just have outdoor theater when they go into the, into the ghettos, basically, and they just put up a screen and they just show movies for free. So that's also, um, it is really, you know, there's certain methods that are really working great in certain communities and some that need to be revised because the spaces aren't as safe. There are certain ghettos that aren't safe at all, where if you are caught speaking against the government, you will be physically assaulted by residents of that neighborhood. So it just depends on how you do it and where you do it, I guess. Perfect. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Deborah? Yeah, perfect. I think, does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to ask? Got one. <laughs> I know we've got two minutes left, but I feel like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't, I won't hopefully won't take up too much time. Just you mentioned briefly about how um, how sort of coronavirus and and um, everything that's happening now is sort of affecting things. What do you think, like the if it's possible to imagine like post COVID nineteen cultural infrastructure? What do you think that that looks like for you? Um, sorry, could you just repeat because I didn't hear the phone kind of broke. You said post um, COVID-19 cultural. Yes. What, what do you think like the cultural landscape looks like when we're through this, whatever this is? Um, post COVID. Wow. Um, I think a lot of people have had time to really settle into what's happening in the country. Um, a lot of Zimbabweans are very, we're, we're such a passive nation at times. And I think that's why it's taken us such a long time to really even get into artivism, for us to even get into, um, you know, demonstrations and rallies and riots and things like that. So I think post COVID, I think a lot of people, because of 
a lot of people, even how the information was being disseminated about COVID, a lot of people still didn't really understand, don't really understand what's going on. And I think a lot of people are angry. I think a lot of opinions are changing. I think a lot of people are just ready to get into the streets and get some sort of change to happen because so many mistakes have been made during this time, which is very unfortunate because this would have been a great time for the government to kind of do better by the country and by the citizens. So I think um, culturally, I think a lot of people are going to start actively participating in more of these campaigns. I think more people are going to be speaking out openly. Um, that's just my hope. I think more spaces are actually going to start opening up because of the need. I think people really need to have those spaces. And I think a lot more people are going to start looking into opening up more spaces for um, artists to come together and express themselves and things like that. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, can we listen to any of your music online? Oh, yes, you can. Um, <laughs> on um, YouTube, um, Vera underscore ZW on SoundCloud and on iTunes as well. Just look for Vera underscore ZW. Yeah. Is that the same for all your socials, Vera? Yes, all of my socials are Vera underscore ZW. I went for um, the easiest thing everywhere and the most unique thing everywhere. And for my hub, if you're interested, we have a podcast that we do. Um, we actually have an episode coming out tomorrow. Um, it's Incubator ZW on all social media platforms. And if you want to watch the podcast, it's Incubator Television on YouTube. So you can check that out. We talk about a lot of... Um, social economic issues we're actually speaking about tribalism and racism um tomorrow so that should be a very interesting talk <laughs>